But it was really important enough for me to stay. I'm Debbie Dingo, member of Congress from uh, Michigan, and I thank you all for coming to this because this is a really important subject. If you live in Dearborn, Michigan, which is my hometown, you hear about it every single day. The recent attention focused, and you know, everybody, we're hearing it, it's not a partisan issue, we hear it on both sides, no fly, no buy, people are very concerned, and I think many people do not understand what the no fly list is. Uh, but it's really, we knew the conversation about why we're all here today. After the September 11th, come on in, get a seat. The September 11th terrorist attacks, the government began building a new terrorist database and established a number of watch lists to prevent future acts of terror. Today, our national terror database and watch lists have grown to numbers larger than many probably realize and are continuing to cause due process problems for innocent individuals who've been added to the watch list. There are far too many stories of innocent doctors, professors, lawyers, and even members of Congress on the no-fly list. And I, I'm going to tell you all the story because I probably won't give you all the names. Uh, but I was in a meeting with a, mem a significant number of members. And, I, you know, I think most of you heard about my gun speech, so I'm as passionate about guns as many other people. But I represent... A lot of people, I, every single day, I have people talking to me about the no-fly list. And I'm trying to help people. And if anybody's trying to help anybody, it's simply the most impossible and difficult thing to do. You don't know why you're on it. You don't know how to get off of it. And uh, so some of the, and it was, I, quite frankly, it was some senior members who said, well, they just appeal it. I said, hey, I cannot say the name. Have you ever tried to appeal it? Have you ever tried to help a constituent? at which point we had a 15-minute intense discussion between members. And finally, John Lewis piped up and said, blank, she's right, I'm on the list. And she knows what she's talking about. And I think one of the issues is that, you know, if you live in a city like I do, where there are a lot of people, and you're trying to help them, and by the way, I don't know if someone's, if, if none of us know all the facts, so you have to be very careful. And national security is all of our number one concerns. But when this country is proud of itself and it's founded on due process, and we need to make sure that we in our, the famous Benjamin Franklin quote, quote those who give up their liberties for a freedom deserve neither. We have to remember that that was a very founding father warning. So, it's estimated that the no-fly list alone contains the names of over 80,000 people. It's like finding a needle in a haystack. But the real problem is we don't really know how many people are on the watch list. Quite frankly, we don't understand how many lists there are. And if you've ever really sat down and talked to people, there are a lot of different lists. And who's on what list and why? Or the process that the government uses to put somebody on it. Do process is virtually non-existent. The no-fly list continues to impact members largely from the Arab American community who continue to face far too much discrimination in the country, including in air travel. You may not know, but I just already told you that, uh, uh, what my just why I represent, why I care about this so much, because I'm always trying to help people. Many courts have recognized the right to travel is a protected liberty under the U.S. Constitution, and it can't be taken away without due process. The Department of Homeland Security has established the Traveler Redress Inquiry Program, known as the DHS TRIP, for this very reason, to give individuals the opportunity to challenge watch list designations. But it's not working as well as it should. And you can go through the entire process without even knowing if you were removed from the list or not. The only way you can find out is to go to the airport, hoping you're going to get on the plane. And you may or you may not. And think what it's like to be somebody that's on that watch list. I understand, you know, I was sitting at the back when we were talking about this next to Joe Kennedy. And I said to him, Joe, 
have we stopped caring about people's civil liberties? Which he throws about too when he goes, you know, my uncle was on it and never got off. I mean, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about lists that we don't know how to create it, how you got in there. And there are people that belong on that list. And I tell my staff, never forget it. But we need to have an ability to have a fair and due process. We've got to improve the watch list procedures that protect those. After a court ruling, DHS has made changes to redress process by improving transparency and communication which is a step in the right direction, but more has got to be done. That's why Representative Zoe Lofgren, Ted Poe, and myself are sending a bipartisan letter next week to the Secretary of Homeland Security regarding the recent changes made to the redress process and added, asking him to improve due process protections for all. Today, there is a diverse panel to brief you on the current state of the use of watch lists by the government. They will also provide updates on reforms to the redress process and will give insight from the communities who are disproportionately impacted by watch lists and counterterrorism practices. The panel will also explore issues and challenges that we will continue to face together as we try to find bipartisan solutions that approve our watch listing practices while keeping Americans safe from terrorism. I'm going to introduce the panel in a minute, but some of you may never have dealt with this issue before. And I want to tell you another story that is making me more passionate than I've ever been about ensuring that we in this country do not target people because of nationality or religion. I had a young Muslim from my district, 20 years old, a class valedictorian. He came to this country from Pakistan when he was young. You know, we all go to school, you've been to college, universities, in high school, civics, you, you hear about and how lucky we are to have freedom of religion, to have freedom of speech. But he was a young man who didn't have freedom of religion. And when he came to this country, did not take for granted what every one of us in this room takes for granted. So he wanted to go fight to defend it because he knows the role that the United States is playing. And then he wanted to go into the FBI. Every single person I have met that knew him talks about what an incredible young person he was, the idealism of him, and how he understood what everybody in this room takes for granted, including me. He died in the Marines within the first two weeks of being in boot camp. The Marines are now acknowledging he was hazed because he was a Muslim. Another colleague who managed to make it through boot camp was put in a clothes dryer by the same drill sergeant that he had and multiple times called a terrorist, acknowledge you're a terrorist, and turned in a clothes dryer and his skin was burned because he was a Muslim. That is not America, that is not what we stand for, and that's why you're all in this room today, to make sure that we've seen in the world what happens when you target a religion. That's what World War II was about. We cannot let that happen. We cannot let fear and hatred divide us. And that is why I'm here talking to you young people today, because you've got to be part of making sure we don't let fear and hatred divide us. So thank you for taking the time to come this morning. I'm going to now introduce you to the panel. With us today is Chris Anders, Deputy Director of the American Civil Liberties Union. You can raise your hands if I introduce you. Well, <laughs> so you've got name tags, okay. Adam Bates, Policy Analyst with the Cato Institute. He's involved with Cato's pro Project on Criminal Justice. Maya Berry, who I've known since she was young. And she still is young, but I knew that she was really young. Executive Director of the Arab American Institute. And Ron Zikassam, Associate Professor of Law at the City University of New York, when he directs the Immigrant and Non-Citizen Rights Clinic. So in closing, I'm going to give you the Benjamin Franklin quote accurately and remind you of again. Those who would give up essential liberty to purchase a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. And I want you to keep that in your souls.
So thank you for being here today. Thank you for taking the time to listen. And I hope you learn a lot from this panel. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. than the frame the Congresswoman just provided. Um, we are um, uh, grateful for her leadership. Um, I say that both as a constituent who is from Dearborn, Michigan, um, though now I'm, I'm here, but a longtime constituent of Congressman Dingell, um, and as someone who very much appreciates the role that you played bringing uh, across party lines people on issues of importance like this. So we're grateful for that. I want to start by putting Kevin on the spot, who is on Congresswoman Dingell's staff, Hi. both in terms of gratitude, um, all your help in this, and to point out the Congresswoman talked about the DHS uh, no-fly list process, the due process letter. It is still circulating, so when you go back to your office, if you could kindly look at a dear colleague from Kevin and let him know that you're happy to join this after this discussion, we would certainly uh, appreciate that. Um, the second resource I want to point out to the Congresswoman talked about the numerous numbers of lists that exist out there. Uh, we took the liberty of preparing an infographic uh, that's available on our website called the Terra Watch List. Um, it attempts to pull together something that's quite frankly all over the place. Um, so it's not perfect, but it does exactly the point of highlighting the various places by which uh, these lists come together and how. So I'd encourage you to look at those. I want to go immediately to our conversation because I think uh, the part I always appreciate most is hearing from the panelists and engaging in the conversation with, with all of you. Um, this is a post-mortem post -mortem on the no-fly, no-buy debate that took place um, with Congress in the wake of the Orlando shooting in June. The Congresswoman made reference to that. Um, the concept of no-fly, no no-buy continues to be endorsed by both presidential candidates, um, but there's uh, a lack of understanding about what that means and how the two have come together in, in this sort of interesting way. Uh, what we hope to not do today is have a debate about gun control. Um, I'm pleased to be joined by colleagues who disagree about that issue from both sides of the aisle. Uh, we all think differently about that, but you might be surprised to know that uh, we actually all, um, I think, share concerns and opposition to the no-fly, no-buy proposal for similar constitutionally based reasons. Uh, what we are here to do today is have a discussion of due process. Um, and not due process when it comes to using a terror watch list as the basis for gun legislation, but rather a, a larger discussion about due process and government watch listing, period. Um, the reason we are given the space to bring this issue to Capitol Hill is because of what transpired after Orlando. Uh, the original legislation proposed denying gun sales to any U.S. individual on a watch list. Make, make sure to, uh, to mention the graphic already. Um, the outrage from the right brought slight modifications to some of the no-fly list, no-fly, no no-buy proposals that sought to give credence to due process before individuals on watch list are secondarily denied uh, Second Amendment rights. The introduced concept of giving a role that the state attorney general and approving gun sales to someone on the no-fly list. Um, those of us who've been tracking the government watch listing for a long time, uh, since the practices rapidly expanded after the terror attacks of uh, September 11th, were disappointed at how this played out politically. Um, you had Democrats saying, quote, due process is what is killing us. And a lot of Republicans were willing to go to bat to protect the Second Amendment right to bear arms, but were silent about due process when it came to the watch list itself. So I think that's the challenge uh, that we, are, we find ourselves in today. Um, and I also want to note, because um, I think it's important to do so, when the Congresswoman talked about <clears throat> the redress process when it comes to um, post-ACLU court decisions, actually, um, I think we now have a better redress process for the no-fly list than you do for the selectee list, partly because of the lawsuits that were brought together, uh, brought forward. So I think it's a, an interesting concept to think about no-fly list versus selectee list, which is even significantly larger, has a better redress process. Um, before I turn it over to our panelists, I want to just sort of highlight why as Arab Americans we bring this conversation. Um, first of all, <laughs> The watch listing is, is one of the ways that national security programs have targeted Arab Americans and American Muslims uh, disproportionately. Uh, it impacts my community, and one needs to look no further than Dearborn, Michigan, the Congresswoman's district. Um, Dearborn, Michigan, a population of 97,000 people, is number two on our government's terror watch list. 
um, only after New York, which has a population of over 8 million people, and um, ahead of Houston, which has a population of nearly uh, over 2 million people. Um, I think you get a sense that um, there's perhaps some disproportionate targeting when you consider 2 million, 8 million, and 97,000. What makes you Dearborn unique? It has the highest concentration of Arab Americans in the country. Um, that particular community is also uh, Arab American Muslims. Um, so I would suggest to you that part of it is a reason about civil rights concern of the community. The other part of it, though, is something also noted by the Congresswoman when she talked about uh, needles in a haystack. Um, one of the most significant problems, whether it's John Lewis or Senator Ted Kennedy, the late Senator Ted Kennedy, is the false positive rate, the false positive rate of the, the watch list itself, um, making us, I would argue, less safe, wasting government resources and uh, not being particularly helpful for the targeting of our, uh, the government on this. So I'm pleased to be joined by our experts today from a wide range of views um, to talk about this concept. I want to start with Adam. Um, who is here with Kato. And I thank you for, for being with us. Um, <clears throat> why don't you start us with sort of the background on the watch listing process um, in the post 9 11 environment? Sure. So, uh, hi, nice to meet you guys. I'm with, uh, the, I'm with Cato's project on criminal justice, and I, I deal with a lot of civil liberties uh, and uh, domestic counterterrorism issues, as well as a lot of, of gun rights issues. So, this was kind of an intersection of uh, when this started up after Orlando, this was an intersection of a lot of my, my areas. Uh, I think we've heard a lot of the background, and I imagine you're actually probably going to hear a lot of the same data points, but uh, I think in this debate, I mean, in this issue especially, uh, the, the data points are so jarring, I think, and worth mentioning over and over again that I don't think it's, it's really going to be uh, a problem. But so essentially, we as a society are being asked a question, right? Can the government deny? constitutional rights to people without proving they've done something wrong or that they represent an imminent threat. Uh, and I think uh, the people up here today uh, and, and critics of, the, of this legislation have an answer. And it's the same answer that the Constitution provides, which is no, of course not. Uh, I, so post 9-11, we had the expansion of these terror watch listing practices. The idea that the government uh, cannot simply respond to terrorist attacks. They need to take some kind of proactive, preemptive measures uh, to identify who people are, who the terrorists are, before they uh, engage in terrorist activity. Uh, I hope you guys all have the hand that you can see uh, what happens. Uh, so against the, the, the advice of the critics, people can be put on these lists uh, on what is called reasonable suspicion of any kind of terrorist uh, activity, association with terrorists, the problem with this, though, when we talk about reasonable suspicion in a legal context, that is a designation that can be challenged in court, right? But in this databasing context, there is no challenge. This is not uh, an adversarial process where you are provided with the evidence against you or you are allowed to confront the witnesses against you in front of a neutral decision maker. This is a, a secretive process. In many cases, in most cases, you're not even notified that this process is going on, right? So even when we talk about the very low standard of reasonable suspicion that gets people put on these lists, it's, it's even lower than you would think if you were trained in the law. Uh, I know there's a lot of lawyers in the room who, for, for whom reasonable suspicion is a term of art, but we're even below that because there is no adversarial process. There's no uh, chance to challenge. Uh, so secret evidence, secret witnesses, and no notification, and what happened is exactly what you would expect to happen in that kind of system, exactly what our founders were trying to prevent uh, when they gave us the right to due process, the right to counsel, the right to question uh, our accusers, uh, this data, the, the, the most updated data we have, says the terrorist identities data mart environment, which is the biggest of the list. There's also a master list that we don't have very good access to, but uh, has 1.5 million people on the list. Just think of that for, for a minute. Uh, the terrorism screening database has about a million names on it. Uh, the select list is... Oh, we're down to 15,000 on the select e list and about 81,000 on the no-fly list. Uh, so when you talk about the, the various legislation, you, one thing you need to look for uh, is which, which list we're using here to take, to take people's rights away, right? Uh, because it could be the list that has 1.5 million people on it. It could be the list that only has 15,000 people on it. But the issue is the same. The issue is the, lack, the complete lack of process, the lack of access to evidence, uh, the lack of the opportunity to, to uh, confront your witnesses. Uh, I think 
Uh, this also speaks to a broader issue that due process and privacy are under siege in this country. Uh, just last night, we heard it pitched that we should have a nationwide stop and frisk program, uh, for instance, that uh, we have the, uh, all of the Snowden revelations about NSA spying. Uh, so this is not just about watch lists. The watch list is a particularly pernicious form uh, of this erosion of due process uh, and constitutional rights, but it's not the only form. This is a, this is a battle that's taking place across uh, the, the, the legal and constitutional landscape right now. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, as, as the Congresswoman spoke to, the, the Muslim community, the Arab American community, the South Asian American community is bearing the brunt uh, of, of, this, of this fight. And it's obligatory on us to, uh, to stand up for uh, our constitutional rights, for uh, due process and privacy. And since this process has lacked that, we've seen exactly what happens when those protections are, are absent. Uh, and the end result, the Congresswoman mentioned, Ted, Senator Ted Kennedy was on a no-fly list. John Lewis uh, has, been on, has been on the list. Dozens of people named Robert Johnson have found themselves <laughs> on the no-fly list uh, with, with no way to get off and no access to, to information for, for what they're doing on the list. Uh, so when we have US senators saying things like due process is killing us right now, uh, or if we had enough evidence to charge people, they would be in prison already, so that's too high a standard to have to prevent them from getting on an airplane or buying firearms. Uh, I think that's a little uh, hint of how big the problem is. Uh, one of the arguments that, that the president made was, and there's some intuitive appeal to this argument, look, if we're not gonna let them on, air, if I can keep them off an airplane, why can't I keep them from buying a gun? There's some kind of logical appeal to that argument, my contention is that that should cause us to question whether they can keep them off of airplanes, not whether they uh, can, can, keep the, can keep people on the list from, from buying firearms. Uh, so we're talking about fundamental rights that go to the core of our country. Uh, the right to due process, the right to confront the evidence against you, the absence of secret juries, secret judges, secret evidence, uh, and more fundamentally, the right to be presumed innocent until proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. Right now, uh, uh, while under this legislation, on, under the no-fly list, the standard for infringing on your liberty there is the reasonable suspicion of a government agent in the absence of all of that process. Uh, that flies in the face of, of the Congresswoman's admonition about liberty and security, uh, evoking Benjamin Franklin, right? Uh, so uh, I think you can, <laughs> you can tell I, I, this is, this is a scary situation, and, and it's, uh, as Maya mentioned, we have this kind of uh, odd coalition building because of the issue of gun rights. So who came out uh, in favor of watch listing when it came to guns versus the no-fly list? It should, we should all be very worried about this due process issue wherever it arises, whether we're talking about guns, whether we're talking about air travel. Uh, so I'm sure Chris, Chris has more on this issue. I don't want to take all his, his data points away from him. So. Uh, Chris is next, right? Yeah, Chris is next. Thank you so much, Adam. Yes, ma'am. Um, Chris with American Civil Liberties Union, thanks so much for the work you all are doing. Um, we, congressional oversight and policy reforms have been a vehicle um, that we've attempted for some time, but I think on these issues, litigation has demonstrated to shift things a bit more. So I was hoping you could share with us the ACLU's success in uh, altering the redress process. And I, and I think I want to start with pick up on a data point that Maya brought up um, a little earlier and, um, and just kind of finish, finish the discussion about Dearborn, which is that as Maya brought up, when, uh, the, when there was a um, disclosure of where residents were of, of people that were on one of the, these watch lists and the number two city um, was, was little, little Dearborn, Michigan, right? Um, there was there was a reaction from some people like well of course They're like yeah Amer a big Arab American population a big American Muslim population the U S attorney though for that part of Michigan stated publicly nobody from Dearborn Michigan has ever been charged with a terrorism related offense or convicted of a terrorism related offense and so one of the things that this goes back to is really these lists are made up of basically somebody in government's idea of trying to predict behavior in the future based on, based on something far less than probable cause, far less than the proof beyond a reasonable doubt, 
far less than than reasonable suspicion. So it's it's based on it's based on you know it, well it's actually hard to figure out exactly what it's based on, but based, it can be based on nothing more than somebody's than somebody's bias, um, little bits and pieces of information that somebody in their head has as as this predicts future behavior. Um, that it's because of that and the consequences of that that. Uh, for the ACLU, years ago, we, we uh, found a group of, um, well, not a group, but 13 different individuals who were all Americans um, who were um, unable to fly um, because they believed that they were on the no-fly list. Um, and so we challenged that in a case called uh, Latif v. Holder um, in Oregon in federal court. Um, the, judge, the judge actually agreed with us. So you know, several years ago, we got the first decision, which was that that this no fly list. Now, if you look at, you know, this, this is a great um, graphic, but you're talking about this little this little circle down here. And there are other there are other watch lists that are much bigger. So what we're focused on is this one right here. Um, and of course, as as Adam referenced, in the legislation that was being dropped uh, related to no fly no buy, a lot of a lot of times it was not even no fly. People were bouncing among these different circles with you know each different bill that got dropped in during that you know few week period um, this summer. Um, but we, the judge basically said that, that that there was a right to fly internationally. Um, that's a constitutional right, and that if um, if the government's going to infringe on that right, it can only be done with providing due process um, to the person whose rights are being infringed. Um, later. So what the judge asked was, was ask the government to provide its redress procedures. Basically, what happens if you're on this list, right? How can you get off the list? Um, so the government provided its redress procedures, which were pretty much next to nothing um, at the time, um, and then came up with some new procedures um, to try to satisfy the court. And because the, the court, I'm sorry, in the second round, the court found that the redress procedures were also unconstitutional. They weren't providing due process. Um, so the so DHS um, through this uh, uh, trip process uh, redress process correct uh, added new added new procedures, um, and we're right now in the middle of negotiations and continued litigation because our concern is that those that those procedures even though they're an improvement over what was you know, next to nothing before, um, still are, you do not allow people to exercise their constitutional rights um, and don't satisfy due process. So here's, here's the way, you now this is just with this, of course, this one circle, right? Here's the way it operates, basically, under the current, under the current redress procedures, is, is you, you can't go, you're not gonna get a letter in the mail or, phone call from the government saying that you're on you're on the no fly list. Instead it's gonna be you're you're showing up at the airport and you're denied boarding and you and you're told that you're you're on the no fly list, right? Um, so that or sorry, then you basically apply, you know, you can apply for redress, then you can be told that you're on the no fly list. Then you can then you can go back to DHS trip and try to um, have a redress. The government on its own can decide whether or not, so you can prove your innocence, right, of whatever it is that got you on, right, which is, of course, is not guilt, right? Um, and then the government can decide on its own whether it wants to provide you with an unclassified <coughs> statement as to why you're on the no-fly list. Um, and the, but the government can provide that, and has to provide that, um, and then, and then that, and then if you want to, they're offering the ability to, to go to a court of appeals, to have a court of appeals to look at it, right? Our, our concern there is that, is that, you know, at minimum, you ought to have the right, everyone ought to have the right to know what that information is. And I think one of the things that the government kind of keeps coming back with is like, well, some of this is, is either classified or based on classified tactics or methods that we use to obtain it. Right. The government has the ability um, under current law to apply in, in day in, day out in courts all the time, to apply what's called Classified Information Procedures Act, which is a way for the government to 
provide to, you know, to provide, provide to the other party, but provide to the court too, information that is a substitute for what, for what, for the actual classified information in a way that protects that information. And so these are these are long established. It's a, long, it's a statute that passed in about 30 years ago, and courts have been using it all the time. The government's very familiar with it. It's not any surprise to DHS or the Justice Department that this exists. They use it day in, day out. But here they basically have said, have said, no, instead, we're going to decide on our own whether we're going to give you anything, right? And then, and then the other problem is that in, in a core part of due process rights is that you have an independent adjudicator, that you basically have the right to have somebody other than the person making the decision about you to, to look at the evidence and decide whether whether you know whether this was properly done or not. And um, in this case, there is there is no independent adjudicator. Now there are lots of different places where that could be. It could be in court. It could be you know in, in an immigration context, for example, where immigration judges or special judges. You know, there, but there's no forum to go to right now where you can have an independent adjudication. Somebody who's not involved in putting on that list, looking at it and saying that you know you shouldn't be on the list or or, or uh, can't be. Um, for everybody else, it's on all these other places. It's a little bit of kind of good luck. I mean, at least at least with you know the the um, no fly list, there's at least some version of procedures. And you know, but they're but they are very deficient procedures. I guess I was thinking about it because you know one of the uh, one of the things I was finding um, during the whole no fly no fly debate was this sense of um, I think if you were in the affected communities, I think it, 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 was, it wasn't quite, it, it was a much greater sense of fear than if you weren't. And, um, and so I guess I was thinking about it a little bit in you know, my own experience in the work that I do, um, where I work on you know, kind of the civil liberties end of national security for the ACLU. And, and, um, and you know, so I was, I was thinking about you know, something that you know, easily could have happened to me, right? It, it probably doesn't because my name is Christopher Anders, right? And uh, you know, Christian was born here and everything else. Um, but but it, you know, a few years ago, I worked on. I spent a lot of time trying to work on getting a, uh, a Yemeni um, democracy activist to come to Congress and testify, uh, which he eventually did. Um, uh, but in the process of doing that, I worked. I spent a lot of time working with the airline. On his flights, I spent a lot of time uh, trying to locate him, uh, emailing back and forth, getting getting different cell phone numbers with him, rearranging his his air, his air flight back, right? Um, and this is and this is all with with a, you know with the Yemeni activist who you know certainly was cleared to come here, right? Um, if if based on that though, you know there certainly could have been somebody in the government. Who could have decided? Hey, why is why is this person negotiating with airlines for, for flight changes? Why is why is he you know arranging for a 22 year old um, Yemeni to come to come to the U.S. And for, for a short period of time and then rearranging several different times airfares and, and rerouting airfares in different ways? Right? Um, I easily could have ended up on no fly list. And would I have found out about it? That was three years ago. Um, this, this summer I went on vacation to Ireland. When I would have found out about it would have been at the airport with my spouse and kids there, and I would, I would have been banned from going on the plane. And, and then I would have had to you know, file, file with DHS. DHS would have said, yes, you're on the no-fly list. Then I would have to go back to DHS, guess, try to guess at why I am on the no-fly list, right? And and you know maybe it would have occurred to me this is what it is maybe it could be something else right provide all kinds of information so you're arguing against a phantom right then DHS can decide well are we going to say why or are we going to say that you know no we picked that up in some kind of you know foreign surveillance information we picked up information about this flight and therefore we're not giving anything um, and then and then my appeal process 
is basically through through DHS, through basically the people that put me on it. Um, now, it's not it's not that far fetched. And the only reason that seems far fetched is that is that you know I don't look like lots of other people in Dearborn, Michigan, right? Um, and um, and so I think you know there's an expectation that that's not going to happen to me. But those kinds of scenarios of simply helping somebody out with their airline flight overseas, having contact with somebody in a place like Yemen, and for lots of people, that means that's their family. <coughs> those are their business associates, or their, those are their college classmates, right? And, and they, end up, they end up, because of those associations, end up on your fly list. And so that's why I think, you know, for our, our concern is that, you know, certainly that there have to be, if, if the government is going to maintain these watch lists, which, you know, you can, you can argue whether, the, whether these watch lists are a good idea at all, even if, if better done. Um, but if they are going to be doing them at all, they really do have to provide that kind of basic due process protection to make sure that if you're wrongly on them, that you should be able to get off them. Thanks. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, this takes us logically to Ramsey, who's here with um, City University of New York's uh, CLEAR project. CLEAR stands for Creating Law Enforcement Accountability and Responsibility. Um, Ramsey, you were part of that CLEAR, efforts to specifically challenge individuals' um, placement on those lists and ability to remove them. Um, can you talk a bit about that process, um, both the Trims and the Fly and the Selective? Um, well, first of all, let me get a sense of the room here. How many of you are applying to go to law school? If you could raise your hand. Okay. I'd encourage you to come to CUNY if you're interested in public interest law. If you want to go to law firms, don't come to CUNY. If you're interested in representing people who are on these lists, uh, my students and I have been doing that since 2009. Um, one of the things you'll learn in law school is to speak in numbered points. And uh, this is a very important skill, which I'm about to demonstrate. So I've got four points I want to make. And the first is actually really a story. It's a story of uh, four of our clients. Um, they, uh, they live in different boroughs in New York City. New York City has five boroughs, as some of you may know. They live in different boroughs. They're all working class, uh, either US citizens or green card holders, legal permanent residents. Um, uh, they're originally from different places, Afghanistan, Yemen, Pakistan. And they work working class jobs, like you know, they run bodegas. One of them works at a 99 cent store. The other works construction. Um, but what happened to them was remarkably similar. Even though they came to us independently of each other, they, they basically told us the same story, which was that they were at work, they were approached by a couple of FBI agents who asked them to do different things for the FBI. Basically asked them to try to recruit them as informants. So they were asked to go online, for example, and pretend to be quote unquote radical. Uh, they were asked to, uh, another one was asked to inform on what was going on in the Desi community, which means the South Asian community. Uh, and our clients, again, independently of each other, for different reasons, ranging from the religious to the political to the personal, said, look, and they all gave the same answer. If you see a crime, we will be the first to report it, but we're not interested in becoming informants because it's against our religious beliefs, it scares us, it's against my personal preference, I just don't want to do it. So they basically all said, no thank you, but we'll, let, we'll definitely let you know if we see something criminal. Um, you know, some time passes, and because each of them has family overseas, they all, like many immigrants in New York City, travel back to those countries once a year or more. So on their next scheduled trip, when they showed up at the airport, they were denied boarding. Uh, and so, and, and a couple of days after that, the same FBI agents came back and found them and said, look, you know, if you had played ball, uh, maybe you wouldn't find yourself in this situation. But since you declined our offer, here you are. And maybe we can take you off this list. Maybe you'll be able to fly home to see your wife and kids or your ailing grandmother if you play nice and if you do what we ask you to do. Um, so these four, men, these four men came to find us and we subsequently uh, sued 24 uh, FBI agents and a number of official capacity defendants in their names. The lawsuit is now uh, Tenvir v. Comey, T-A-N-V-I-R. Um, and I'll tell you one more thing about this lawsuit. Our first major court appearance in the case was on Friday. It was June 12, 2015, if I remember correctly. On Tuesday, we get a call from the assistant U.S. attorney representing all the defendant agents. And what she said to us was very noteworthy. She said, uh, I can tell you that all four of your clients can now board a plane. Would you agree to dismiss your complaint? Would you agree to dismiss your lawsuit? 
Now these men had been on the no-fly list for years. Right? They hadn't seen their daughters, they hadn't seen their spouses. Um, one of them lost job opportunities because he was a truck driver and that requires driving a truck out to California, for example, and then flying back. So he, had to, he lost that job because he could no longer fly. So it's very serious personal and professional costs borne by them and their families. And she said, you know, will you dismiss your lawsuit um, because you know, I can guarantee you now that they can fly. The lesson here is that they were never no fly listed. They weren't no fly listed for reasons having to do with aviation safety, which is what the no fly list is supposed to be about. If you read what's publicly available about it, government issued regulations. They were no fly listed in retaliation for exercising their First Amendment right not to associate as an informant, as informants with the FBI. Um, and so we agreed to dismiss a part of the case, uh, the due process part of the case we agreed to dismiss, but we moved forward on the rest because our clients had to be made whole uh, for all of you know, everything that they've experienced, both professionally and personally. Um, the second point I want to make is that you've heard a lot about reasonable suspicion, right? Uh, and and, and as, as my colleagues have mentioned, reasonable suspicion means something in the legal world when you're able to test it in court. But we actually have some insight into what it means in the, no, in the murky no-fly list world. Um, the US government's March 2013 watch listing guidance was leaked to an online outlet named The Intercept. You should look it up online because you can now access this document online. And it's a really uh, edifying read. So I will, I will quote for you some of the language that that watch listing guidance, which the federal government still uses, to the best of my knowledge, to define reasonable suspicion in the context of who is placed on these lists, right? It says, quote, uh, quote, concrete facts are not necessary. This is their language, not mine. I'm not characterizing this. what's exactly in the guidance. Uh, there are a number of loopholes, by the way, that dispense with reasonable suspicion altogether, right? So, um, so if your immediate family members or the associates of a known or suspected terrorist uh, are, are identified, they can be listed too, based on really guilt by association. Uh, so they themselves are not known or suspected terrorists. They just happen to be associates, quote unquote, or family members. Also, those with a quote unquote possible nexus to a known or suspected terrorist. So again, you're getting at varying degrees of attenuation, uh, increasing degrees of attenuation. What is a possible nexus? That is not defined. Is it a hunch? Uh, is, it, is it an investigator's bias? It could be, right? So there's immense room for discretion, and the net result is that these watch lists operate as a ratchet. It's very easy to be quote unquote nominated, this is how the government speaks about it. It's very easy to be watch listed, and it's exceedingly difficult to be removed uh, from, from the watch list. Um, you know, so we've represented dozens of people on the no fly list, on the selectee list, and we've succeeded, my students and I in clear have succeeded since 2009 in getting a number of them off. But oftentimes, you know, it takes dogged uh, advocacy. You have to be very persistent. You have to be very creative. And when we submit these strip complaints, right, on behalf of these clients who are no fly list or CLT listed, we get these absurdly Kafkaesque letters back from the Department of Homeland Security. And I wanted to read some of those for you because they're, I mean, it would be comedy were it not reality. Um, and, and, and it should highlight for you how error prone and unreliable these lists are, if there's any doubt about that. So one of the sort of stock sentences you'll find in these letters is that, they, is that the, the agency can neither confirm nor deny uh, whether your client is on one of these federal watch lists. And you get that whether or not you're, whether you're advocating for someone on the no-fly list or on the select list. So that's stock language. The other thing that's very common is the following language. Quote, about 2% of complainants actually have um, no, have, about 2% 2, 2 of complainants actually have some connection to the terror watch list. What that means is that 98% do not. Um, another quote, complaints most often arise because the traveler's name and personal information is similar to the name and personal information of another person. Translation here, the watch lists are littered with cases of mistaken identity. Uh, and so real people are paying the price every day because of these flawed uh, systems that are in place and that are being touted as somehow very reliable and accurate. Um, and as a model to be applied in other settings like gun control. Uh, so, so my last point is basically, why should you care? Uh, I mean, I know that Representative Bingo made an appeal uh, to our collective veteran angels. Uh, she made an appeal to our sense of American values that you know this is disproportionately affecting Arab Americans and Muslim Americans. But I'm going to try to tap another uh, you know vein of American political thinking, political thought, political theory, really. I'm going to try to appeal to your self-interest. Uh, 
Because many people believe that this only applies to Muslims right now. It's only them, it's these others. Uh, and that may be true currently if you just took a snapshot today. What I can tell you from our experience is clear is that in 2009, when my students and I started representing people affected by these kind of terrorism policies and practices, the overwhelming majority of our clients were Muslims. But in the last couple of years, we've noted a very interesting trend. Uh, we, we're seeing increasing numbers of people come through our doorsteps asking for our representation because we have these skill sets that we've developed working for a Muslim demographic. But those folks are not Muslims. They're anti-war activists, they're environmental activists, they're Black Lives Matter activists, and they're being targeted in exactly the same way. The FBI is showing up at their doorstep to question them unannounced. Uh, they're facing travel difficulty, they're finding themselves on a selectee list or an L-fly list. And my point here is that once these tools exist, once this apparatus exists, there is nothing stopping the government from applying it to other target populations. And in fact, it's the natural thing to do. We know that from history. And so unless we check it at this stage, unless we cabinet, control it, rein it in, uh, rationalize it, uh, it is going to eventually affect you and the constituencies that you may care about more than Muslim Americans. Thank you so much, Ramsey. Um, thank you to all of you. That's uh, exactly the conversation we wanted to assemble today. We're grateful for that. I certainly have questions, but I will turn it over to all of you first. Um, if you've got a question, please just raise your hand. Go ahead. If you could just identify your name and office. Yeah, um, I'm Sarah Butchus. I don't work in the senator's house. I'm actually with a company called Fiscal Note that uh, one of their missions is open data and transparency. Um, I first wanted to thank you all for being here. I think this is an incredible issue to be talking about, especially right now, um, and it touches me personally, so I really appreciate it. Um, my question was sort of all of you, um, you all mentioned how a majority of these lists are obviously innocent bystanders. Um, I was wondering if currently you're more focused on sort of adding due process and um, sort of helping people get off this list, or maybe eliminating it and starting from scratch, um, which I understand sounds sort of like an insane idea, but. Uh, it's just a thought I had, and I was wondering uh, to hear your thoughts about it. Thank you. Um, I mean, I think at least most of our effort has been on, you know, on do, getting more due process protections, particularly for getting people off the list, right? And I, and I think, I think with the hope that if that happens more often, if you have better protections, that that will be more um, sensitivity. By the government as to really put people who goes on to the list in the first place. Um, I mean, these lists have been around for a long time. I mean, certainly there was a, has been an explosion of them over the last 15 years, but they, you know, the, the idea existed before that. Um, and um, but I think right now, I think, and which I think is why we're all together today, is I think that there's a lot of worry about what other rights are being. Um, once you have this kind of list, like what other what other rights are going to be conditioned on you know presence or absence on, the, on these lists, and um, and then how further do they expand? I, I think one of the you know one of the in in during the summer when 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 this debate was happening, um, something that happened very quickly and in in this process was um, and it happened more on the Senate side because they kind of addressed it first was um, was it after these bills got some momentum in the Senate um, someone pointed out to Senator Feinstein that well the shooter in Orlando wasn't on a no fly list it wasn't on any watch list um, at that at the time that that happened um, so instead she so that she amended the bill by saying well if over the past I can't remember if it's three years or five years you've been on a watch list then you can't purchase a gun so essentially it's creating a watch list of everybody that's been on a watch list right because somebody has to maintain that list so that means that even if you were off the list taken off the list you're on a new list right a, a list of people that have been on the list right and and so i think it just kind of points out you know how how like kind of crazy this process has become. Instead of focusing in on, you know, what kind of harm we're we're trying to address, it's it's adding it's adding. I think for political reasons, you know, lots of different categories. So I think, you know, right now, I guess the short answer is 
you know, we're, we're very focused on the due process aspects of it to, you know, get elicit to more targeted. Um, and then, but then I think that the other piece of it is just making sure that that no additional rights are, are being conditioned on that list. Uh, I, I agree, I'm, uh, obviously. And uh, uh, I think what uh, Ramsey mentioned uh, goes into that, that, this idea that once we've created this mechanism, right, the, the potential for this to snowball. So despite the fact that they don't have to, uh, Oh, I'm sorry, I thought somebody was talking. <laughs> Despite the fact that there's very no evidentiary showing to get you on the list, and it's very difficult to get off, some people have managed to get themselves off the list only to then have the US government now come back and threaten to say, you weren't on the list for a good reason, or we've cleared you, you're, you're innocent as far as the FBI is concerned, but we're still gonna, to, we're, you're still gonna be on a new list and you're still gonna have your, your liberty infringed. Uh, so I, I think, Yes, I think I share skepticism, and I, I, you can persuade me that maybe it's time to junk it and start over, right? But uh, a bigger part of it, at least part of my job, is talking to legislators and talking to people about this, and that it's much easier and more persuasive to go in their office and say, due process. You know, these are words that everybody, everybody up here knows. Uh, so the, the due process concerns and adding these safeguards, I think, get the bulk of the conversation in this town because uh, the, the suggestion that we should start over is, is kind of further outside what we call the Overton window, right? It, that's a more uh, long-term goal, but I, I, I do share the concern. Can I, can I add something to that? Uh, I, I think, you know, I think on our end, we're actually working on both tracks, and I, and I appreciate sort of the, the radical premise of your question in terms of like pushing the envelope we're pushing the conversation beyond like the commonly accepted boundaries because obviously we are trying to make you know due process improvements and we received the same notice in our Tendir case that the ACLU received in its Latif case, the notice of these revised uh, DHS trip procedures which are supposed to increase fairness and, and transparency. But the reality of these revised procedures is that they only apply to green card holders and US citizens. So you know this is a country of immigrants. There are many people in our country who are neither green card holders nor uh, U.S. citizens, and you know, still should not be dumped on the list without any recourse. But this new process does not apply to them, and, and and there are very serious questions about how adequate this new process is in terms of are the summaries uh, going to really give the person enough of a grip on whatever the accusation is to be able to rebut it. Uh, so I think Chris did a very good job of highlighting the possible continuing inadequacies of even this revised trip procedure. So on our end, we are asking the hard question of you know. To what extent do we really need a no-fly list? I mean, keep in mind that on September 11, 2001, there were 16 names on that list. Today, there are 81,000 based on the most recent reports, right? And so when you look at this chart, which, which is really great, um, you'll see that the selectee list is actually smaller than the no-fly list. And so even if you're not a no-fly list abolitionist, you have to ask yourself, how is it that there are so many people who are deemed so dangerous that no amount of screening as a selectee would cabin that danger and enable them to travel. I mean, I, I would think just intuitively that the selectee list should be much larger than the no-fly list. I mean, we can, let's say, for the sake of argument, accept that there's a number of people that we don't want on any plane under any circumstances. That number should be small. I feel like however dangerous that individual is, I mean, it's not going to be Magneto. You know, they should be able to screen that person and, you know, then allow them to board, making sure that they have nothing, no explosives, no weapons at their disposal, whatever it is. Because again, the purpose of the no-fly list by the government's own account is aviation safety. Thank you. Um, please. Um, uh, my name is Bob Nomar. I work as a communications intern with the uh, Air Marine Institute. Uh, my question is, uh, I think, I, I feel that the point on uh, Omar Mateen's uh, status not being on the watch list, what the Obama administration's response as well as the, uh, the government has been to put everybody on the watch list, to increase the watch, uh, uh, watch listing uh, uh, I've seen over the past uh, uh, few years. And uh, as, this, as this has been accepted incredibly by the, uh, in the American psyche, uh, I think that politically this has become almost it, 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 not, I don't want to say impossible, but it, it seems almost non-viable to a pushback. I'm saying that the snowball is already down the hill, the Kingsley courts are open. What my question is, how do, how, how do we move from make, making this, I guess, a, a conversation that's in a certain specific sect um, and kind of inserting it into the mainstream, into the American consciousness, how to make these stories 
uh, as Dr. Christine spoke about, more known to the public? I think to underscore that point, right, if it were it not for the debate about no, no buy, no fly, we wouldn't actually be even having this conversation on, on, on the Hill, regrettably, because we've asked for that oversight, it just hasn't come in. But who wants to touch on that? Yeah, I think one of the things, I think that Maya's exactly right. I mean, I think the conversation and just kind of how, um, how dominant that, you know, maybe, maybe it's because of bonds, no fly, no fly. I don't know why it's kind of caught on like all the ideas out there on how to address what took place in Orlando. Um, I have no idea, and maybe some of you do, um, why that's what people latched onto, especially since he wasn't even on the no fly list, he wasn't on a list. Right, um, and um, but for whatever reason, it kind of captured people's imagination, and that's what they that's what they uh, started to obsess with. I do think that the good part of that debate was that I do think that once um, once people started settling down a little bit and thinking about it, I think that there were a lot of members of Congress um, in both parties who started to wonder like, well, what is this no fly list anyway? And who's on it? And why? Why is it? Why is it that we're tying things to it? And I think, and I think you know, to give to give credit to um, some of the Republicans. Um, now, you know, certainly some of it, you know, may have been motivated by um, very well, may have been motivated by the, the gun control aspect of it. Um, but I think looked looked really carefully at, you know, is this? Do we really want to be hinging rights on? on a watch list that doesn't have basic due process protections. And this is all based on, you know, it's based on predicting the behavior in the future based on very flimsy kinds of evidence. That's different than, you know, if this was a list that was made up of people that have, that have been convicted or people that have, that have arrest warrants that are outstanding. And the part that I think, you know, is frustrating for some of us who work on this is that is that, you know, I don't think it's a good idea that we have such broad anti-terrorism laws, but it's a fact that the, the U.S. criminal law on anti, of anti-terrorism laws, particularly material support, are very, very broad laws. Um, if you're a prosecutor and you can't get a conviction of somebody or you can't charge them for, for material support for terrorism, they really haven't done it, right? It's, it's a, it's very, it's very broad, and so, why, you know, why if, you know, if, if the United States really is worried, if the country is really worried about a particular person and really believes that they've done something wrong, there, is, there, are, there are actions that the United States can take and does take in lots of contexts. Um, and, you know, here, here, you know, they don't have that kind of evidence. And, and so the only thing they can do is, is put somebody on a watch list and you know, as, as Rams has brought out with some of his examples, a lot of times it's it's being done simply because because you have an FBI agent or somebody else in government who's angry at somebody for not for not doing what they wanted them to do. So I think it's a it's a really dangerous for lots of different reasons. It's a really dangerous road to go down. I do think that the public attention to the to the terrorist watch list. I think particularly having having you know conservative Republicans taking a look at it. You know what is what is behind this? I think was a really constructive aspect of this whole thing. Our worry, kind of politically right now, is that is that this has become this seemed to become over the summer something that that is is like a kind of core demand of one particular party that they're looking to get done at some point. And that, you know, our hope is that that you know that some of your bosses and others. We'll, we'll take a pause and say, like, you know, wait, there's lots of other way, ways we can address the underlying problem of gun violence without without going to this and, and find a way to de-link the two. I would, I would just add real quick that I think this is kind of uh, a pushback a little on, on what Ramsey said earlier about the, the, so there is this potential to snowball, right, once this machinery uh, is created and then to expand outside the Muslim or, or Arab American or South Asian community. In this, in the no fly, no buy context, we saw though how the system kind of checks the, the 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 growth of that, right? So as Chris said, when you when you talk about watch listing people in Dearborn, you have this hundred thousand person city that's second on the on the surveillance list. A lot of Americans, unfortunately, just kind of shrug their shoulders and go, well, well, yeah. Uh, but when 
that this grew to, okay, now this is a gun issue. Uh, that tripped, that tripped a lot of alarms uh, for a lot of people who, who otherwise are not that interested in this issue or are even antagonistic about it. So when, when it stepped outside that Arab, Muslim, South Asian context and started going after people's gun rights, for instance, it got checked, right? And, and these, these proposals didn't, the, unlike the no-fly list, these proposals uh, didn't make it through. So there is that element of it, uh, I think, to emphasize the, the effect that this has on certain communities that do not have uh, the kind of political capital that, that gun rights advocates uh, have. Let me, let me just add one, one quick note on that, because I, I, think, I think the point you're making is extremely important. And it's for that reason that on our end, we always try to put our clients' stories out there. I mean, you'll see, for example, the four plaintiffs that I mentioned in our no fly list case, they've done plenty of interviews on television with outlets like the Washington Post, the New York Times. Uh, we recently had an, a reporter from The Guardian spend you know, three days with a client of ours who was on the no fly list that we were ultimately able to get removed from the no fly list, the fifth client apart from those other four in the Tanvir case. And, and we'd be perfectly happy to you know, have those individuals come and tell their story to your bosses here, if, uh, because I do think that would be compelling as well for, for people here to see you know, firsthand what the impact of, of these listing, watch listing procedures have been on, uh, on US citizens and, and permanent residents. Because the best antidote to the secrecy of the fly list and sort of the silencing of the individuals who who are affected by the no-fly list is the opposite, is to bring it out into the open, is to have them tell their own stories rather than be spoken about as these shady individuals on the no-fly list. Uh, so we're perfectly happy to facilitate that and clear if, if any of you uh, are interested in doing that sort of thing and, and bringing those voices forward. I'm Jason Berger, I'm with the Congressman Hastings office. I wanted to follow up on the previous discussion that you guys were having on gun rights. And Specifically, has the gun rights lobby taken an issue on no fly, no buy specifically, or, have, or is it, did it lose silence due to the, kind of the outflowing of support for that perspective? Uh, so, uh, the, the, to the best of my recollection, because this is you know, trying to call back a little bit, uh, the NRA, the gun lobby was more okay with uh, the Cornyn bill that it did have some kind of within three days. Uh, they have to show probable cause. They have to take the person into custody. Uh, we're more comfortable with that, with those process protections. Uh, I, as a gun rights ad activist, uh, was not uh, that, that big a fan of the Cornyn bill either. I agree with the ACLU's argument against it. Uh, but outside of the, of the Cornyn bill, I think that it was pretty uh, uniformly opposed because of the, of the concern uh, that, yeah, these lists, uh, these lists are not going to be limited to the Muslim I mean, I personally think people should be as offended that, that, that the Muslim community is being affected by this. But yeah, this, this understanding that this is not going to be limited to this community forever. This is, this is a new machine for the government to use, uh, and, and we better nip it in the bud before it, it, it starts rolling. Any questions? Can I, I'm going to ask, I recall the conference call that um, Department of Justice convened after the ACLU um, decision on the no-fly list came through, and they convened um, coalition groups to basically announce this new redress process. And I think you've heard from, from our colleagues why that process is flawed, but at least it's, it's there, right? I, I have a very difficult time wrapping my head around the idea that the selectee list, which is presumably less dangerous, Right, than the no-fly list, because those are folks who are watching, but they can fly, so I guess less dangerous if you adopt this frame, has no redress process at all. I remember asking on that call specifically, is it just going to apply to this, or does it apply to this other group, which is presumably less dangerous, and the answer was no. Um, what is that process now? What's the best thing we can hope for on the selectee list? Yeah. Litigation moving forward that way to get us to the point where they accept a better bit. Yeah, without, without talking about litigation, we may or may not be planning. Um, <laughs> I like hearing that. I will, I will say that, um, you know, I will say, well, I'll give you another story just to make it simpler. I mean, I, we had a client who was, you know, an Afghan American, US citizen for like 30 years. He's, he's about 65 years old. He's a mechanic in Queens, has a, he has a repair shop. Um, and, you know, he, he travels a lot. He has family in Canada, so they often travel by land and sometimes they may fly. Uh, and every time for the last, you know, for over two years, 
um, he was being uh, subjected to extra scrutiny at the land crossing, or when he went to the airport, when he printed his boarding pass, he found four S's on it, which is a telltale sign of being on the selectee list. Uh, and this sort of culminated in an incident where he was traveling back by air with his uh, father, who's uh, elderly, uh, suffers from dementia, is wheelchair bound, and his son, his teenage son, who, who's mentally disabled. Uh, so two individuals that he is the primary caretaker for. They arrive at the airport, uh, he is taken into secondary screening, uh, and, the, and the CBP officials want to separate him from, from his father and his son. And he tries to explain to the, officials, to the officers that you know, he can't leave them alone, that you know, he's their primary caretaker, and the officers reassure him that it's only going to be a couple of minutes. So they take him into a separate area, keep him there for four or five hours. He, he tries to, he pleads with them, uh, to no end, tells them that his sister is waiting outside, that they should at least let the father and the son out or let the sister in. They refuse. After three or four hours, he's finally able to, to find them in the area where he left them, like a baggage claim, basically. And, um, and, they, uh, and he finds that you know, his father is uh, soaked in his own urine. Uh, his son has, has also soiled himself and, and is basically losing control because you know, he, has, he has a very serious mental disability. So that's been the effect on him and his family of being on the selectee list. Um, and so that's when he sought us out. We engaged in lengthy administrative advocacy, reaching out to the agencies directly by phone and in writing, uh, reaching out to uh, people here in Congress to elicit, uh, to elicit their support. Uh, and ultimately our client was removed from the selectee list, right? It was another case of mistaken identity, uh, or supposedly it was. But, but frankly, he never received an apology from the US government for the years of humiliation that he and his family had to endure. Uh, he never received uh, an acknowledgement even uh, that, that this was wrong, what happened to him and, and to his family. So that is the process uh, as it exists today for the selectee list. When you submit a complaint, you're gonna get one of what we've determined are three types of responses uh, that are you know, not promising at all, sort of neutral or promising. And then from there, that dictates different follow-up advocacy steps that my students and I have undertaken uh, to significant levels of success, but it's still extremely time-consuming and aggravating for the individuals who are who find themselves on this list. And so there has to be, uh, you know, I mean, I think it, we can't call that a process. It is not a process. It's a procedure, uh, and it's a highly inadequate procedure. If I may, just another one on this point. I don't know if this is the case or not, but we we hear from folks that are on the selectee list often. Um, and one of the ways in which it's come up is that um, someone has had no issues and then they apply for a TSA pre-check or they apply for global entry and then all of a sudden there's a problem that starts to develop on the selectee list. Not no fly, but selectee. Uh, I would just wonder if you all have heard of, of that taking place at all. No, but that's really interesting. You can stop Okay. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> I've not heard that until now, but now I'm curious. Are there any other questions from the audience? I don't want to dominate our conversation. Wonderful. Thank you so much again for joining.